Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If this is your first time here and you begin to love what you are hearing, we would love to have you as part of the family. All you simply have to do is hit that subscribe button and make sure your notification bell is set to all. That way you won't miss a video that is uploaded to this channel. Also, if you would like to learn how to become a subscriber of the channel or would like to buy me a coffee as a special thank you, that information can be found down below. Without further ado, it is now time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person every day. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack or tuck in and get warm and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Ouija Stories. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. Warning, some of these stories may contain material not suitable for all. Listener discretion is highly advised. When I was a young teen, my best friend and I spent a summer surfing the Ouija board. Mostly, we just ask silly or mundane questions, and mostly we get answers that seem to fit. There was never a specific spirit or entity associated with our Ouija board explorations, and we never felt threatened in any way. Until the day, that all changed. One day, a specific personality started to communicate with us. He was male and forceful. He would tell us to do things, harmless things like take a poster off the wall or something, but still, it was weird. I asked him his name, which he provided. I don't remember it anymore, so I'll just call him Gordon. I asked him where he had lived before becoming a spirit. He gave an address in a nearby small town. I never went to his town, so I had no idea if it was real or not. But I had a map, so I could look it up. It was real. I asked my sister to drive me there. I was still too young to drive. Just to check it out. My friend was spooked and didn't want to go. So my sister and I go to this address, an ordinary-looking house in a wooded cul-de-sac. Nobody was around, so I knocked on the door. No answer. I'm not willing to give up, so I knock on the next door, the neighbor's door. A guy answers. He looks like he's maybe in his 50s or 60s. Too young to be old in my eyes, but older than my parents or the parents of my school friends. I ask him if he knows if a Gordon ever lived in the house next to him. He thinks for a minute, gets a little far away look in his eyes, then says, Ah, yes, someone named Gordon did used to live there, but he disappeared about 15 years ago, and nobody knew why or what had become of him. He couldn't tell me anything more, just said he didn't remember anything about Gordon, other than that he lived there, and then he didn't. I couldn't wait to get home and tell my boyfriend, I couldn't wait to pull out the Ouija board and find out more. When we did, Gordon came through right away. He was more aggressive than ever, insisting we do this and that, draw this, gather that. It felt creepy, even though none of it was hurtful or inappropriate. It just felt wrong. I asked why he wanted us to do these things, and he only grew more insistent. More edgy, more dangerous feeling. I said, no, we're not going to do it. Why do you want it so badly? He understood that I had drawn a line that I wouldn't cross, so he told us that if we'd done what he'd asked, then we could get up to trade places with him, whatever the fuck that meant. And then there was this demonic laugh spelled out over and over again on the board. Damn, poke out my eyes with a stick so I never have to see that again. It freaked us both out, and that was the last time we ever played with a Ouija board.
When I was in the Air Force, I went off base with my roommate. Unbeknownst to me, some of my other friends in my dorm had pulled out a Ouija board. They had connected with a spirit and asked a couple of questions. However, the group didn't trust that someone wasn't pushing the planchette around. My good buddy, Lewis, asked a question of the spirit. Where is Elrich, a Yorick? Lewis was the one that knew I was off base, so he would know if someone was pushing the planchette around, forcing an answer. The planchette moved around the board, giving four numbers. The group was confused, and they thought about what the four numbers could be. While they discussed what the four numbers could mean, one of the guys that was observing, named Newberry, said, Hey, I'm going to head up to get some drinks from my room. As he was heading out the door, he realized, Oh, and uh, those four numbers, they're the same as my room number. Everyone joked about that being in Newberry's room, trying on his underwear or something. Newberry left their first floor room to head up to two flights of stairs to the third floor to get to his room. I had just gotten back from my night out and was still kind of early for a Saturday night. I stopped at the front of CQ to check in, talked to some other friends, and made my way back to my dorm room. As my roommate unlocked the door, I noticed my neighboring doormate light was on. Light was showing under the door, that's how I knew. I knocked on his door and called out his name. Hey, Newberry. My roommate realized Newberry wasn't answering and said, he's asleep. I don't know what got in me, but I had to see him, so I knocked again. Hey, Newberry, open up. Right then, from down the hall, I hear Newberry's voice yell, What the fuck? At the end of the hall is an emergency staircase that is the back way of getting down to the first floor, if we're in a hurry. Newberry said, What the fuck? At least two more times as he walked up to me, standing in front of his door. He told me, Elrich, Aorik, don't move. He unlocked his door, went into his room, grabbed some soda, and said, Holy shit. With excitement as he closed and locked his door. He grabbed me by my shoulder and said, Come on. We quickly went back down to the emergency stairwell, down two flights of stairs, and across the room were my buddies, still sitting around the Ouija board. Newberry knocked and slowly opened the door, keeping me back so that they couldn't see me. He entered the room saying, You ain't gonna believe this, and pulled me into the room. My friends were looking at me like they had seen a ghost. Before anyone could say anything, Newberry said out loud, He was standing in front of my door. I'm sure you have heard of the movie Ouija and seen some videos, but what I'm about to tell you is my story of the Ouija board and what happened to me. Take this story as a warning. Ouija boards can be dangerous if you use them in the wrong way. Please do not make the same mistakes I did. Here is my story. Hello, my name is Jay and I'm 18 years old. Look. I'm sure there will be a lot of people who won't believe what I'm about to tell you, but no matter how crazy this sounds, no matter how out of this world it is, it's all true. This is a true story about something that happened to me last year. The only reason why I'm telling you this is so you don't make the same mistakes I did. Believe me, when I tell you that you shouldn't fuck with them, I'm only going to tell you this once. So please listen to me here and now. Do not try this at home. Take what you are about to hear to heart and let it be a warning to you all. It was maybe a year ago, sometime in October, as cheesy as it seems, and I've always loved the cult. It was my big thing, and being a pagan family made it even better for me, to be more precise, a Wiccan family. And I'm sure you can figure out that Wiccan is related to the word witch. No, I can't turn you into a frog. I don't worship the devil. I don't fly on a broomstick. 
I'm not Harry Potter. And I don't have a pointy green nose with a pointy hat. I'm just me, a normal kid. All of my friends know that I love the occult and that I was always reading about the most haunted areas around me to go visit and find some evidence to see something. I'll admit, I have seen some shit from the corner of my eye, but the story I'm telling you is on a whole other level itself. It's more than just seeing shadows in the dark. Out of the many years I've done this, I've only had two pants shitting experiences. This is number two, pun not intended. Another thing is that I've used a spirit board for a long time, for about 10 years, give or take, and I've never had a problem using one. Nothing bad had ever happened, mostly because I knew the rules and the movie Ouija didn't help the whole thing. So, I'm going to give you some rules just in case if you ever decide to use a spare board, which will most likely be a Ouija board. Number one, always say goodbye. This is the only thing that the movie got right. When you're using the board, you are opening a doorway to another world. If you leave it open, who knows what kind of shit you're letting in. Number two, stay positive. If all you're doing is letting good in, you're not going to get anything evil like a demon out. A good way of doing this is to imagine a light coming from your heart and surrounding you and anyone you're using it with. Keep the light happy. Keep positive. Don't let any of your negative emotions in. You need to feel safe and unafraid. Number three, respect the spirit. Treat them like important guests and do not make fun of them, ever. No ifs, ands, or buts, that's it. Number four, do it somewhere where there's nothing negative. So if you're thinking of using a Ouija board in an abandoned building, a cemetery, or anywhere that is known to have negative spirits, don't even think about doing it. Number five, don't ask about your future. Don't ask about yourself. Don't even tell them your name. Ask about them and only them. That's how you stay in control of the conversation. Also, don't ever, ever, ever ask how they died. It's fucked up and disrespectful. Number six, don't ask for it to show itself or its power. That's like saying, hey, come and take over my body. I don't know what or who you are, but okay. Don't be that idiot, please. Are you and your friend's safety? Those are the six biggest rules. To open the door, you don't have to chant or put your blood on it or any of that mess. All you really have to do is barely touch the planchette a.k.a. the pointer, and ask, is anyone willing to speak with us? One person should be in control of the questions. Also, it may take some time for the planchette to start moving. It could take up to hours. Some protection I recommend is salt, holy water, white or red candles, sage, and whatever religious signs you believe in. For example, if you're a Christian, Wear a cross around your neck. Incense works pretty well, too. My friends have always asked to use the board with me, so I decided to throw a Halloween party, and we would use the board. That was the biggest mistake ever. Everything went well from planning the party up until we decided to use the Ouija board. I left my sister in charge of the board in the other room, along with everyone else who wanted to join in. I, on the other hand, was with the others who did not want to use the board, which I respected, and we hung out. Every once in a while, I would check in on everyone. An hour or so passed before I got a text from my sister. Get in here now, is what the text read. I panicked a little inside my head when I read that. I walked into the room as calmly as I could hold it and asked what was going on. My friend Robert, let's just call him that, 
said that the board was spelling out F-U-C-K-Y-O-U. At this point, as you're hearing the story, I bet you're thinking that this is all bullshit that I made up. But no, this is actually what happened. I laughed and said that we should all start eating the food and playing games. Everyone left the room, leaving my sister and I alone. The look on her face, I will never forget. It's burned into my brain for life. It was the look of pure worry and fear. My sister and I cleansed the house and went on with the party and everything was fine. Nothing happened until about two weeks later. I started to see shadows and hear three knocks on my door or my window or even the walls. For those of you who don't know, three is a very, very bad number. If you hear three knocks or see three scratches on you, it's something demonic and you need to get rid of it right away. I'd see tall black figures and black dogs from the corner of my eye. I'd even wake up with bruises and scratches on me. But the nightmares and terrors is what did it for me. It took me a week to figure out how to get rid of it. I didn't want to tell my parents I honestly regret it. I was home alone when I decided to cleanse the demon out of my house. I remember burning the sage and the chant. I'd tell it that it wasn't welcome here and it had to leave. It's fuzzy. I really don't remember a lot during the cleansing, but what I definitely remember is the worst pain I'd ever have. I don't even know how to explain it. It just burned really bad to the point of blacking out. I remember waking up in a hospital bed with my mom, dad, and sister all sitting next to me. The doctor said it was a suicide attempt. I remember looking down at my left arm and it was wrapped up. Later on, when I could take off my bandages, that's when I saw it. Three deep claw marks going down my arm. One next to my vein. After all that, I spent three months in a place called Uni, but my sister and I know the truth. It was that demon. Now, I could tell you something like, it still follows me today, but that'd be a lie. When I came home from uni, the presence was gone. No more shadows, no more nightmares, no more dogs, etc. It was all just gone. Even though this happened because of a Ouija board, I still use it, even today. And it's like nothing ever happened. I won't let fear control me, and spirit boards are a big part of my life. I'm going to call this one the Ouija Revisited. I have recently relayed a story about Ouija boards and seances, so hence the title of this one. It also has a double meaning, as it involves a guy who did happen to revisit the Ouija board after many years of absence. Something he regretted and that managed to scare him enough the second time for him to swear off the activity of necromancy. That is, summoning the dead for good. I wouldn't do it again, especially knowing what I know now. He is quick to admit it. His name is Alan, 35 years of age, a grandson of the nice old lady who lives next door to me. When he visits her, he sometimes drops in and says good day, and maybe have a thirst quencher or two. He is quite happy being identified I think he fancies the idea of being famous on the World Wide Web. Don't you know? I can't recall how we even got onto the subject of seances, but as often happens with people I meet, it was that subject we soon found ourselves discussing. I actually took notes as there was a bit to remember, and it is from these sparse notes in my recollection that I now proceed with the telling of a most interesting account of the Ouija and why. If the first visit isn't enough to scare you away, then you better hope the second one is. 
It is amazing how quickly things can spread just by word of mouth, let alone with modern technology. Fads, recipes, good news, bad news. Hopping from one person to another like rapidly multiplying rabbits. For some, the information will be quickly forgotten, but for others, it may act as a catalyst to try something new. To try that new recipe, to buy that latest album everyone's raving about, to make a point to see this or that movie, or perhaps conjuring the dead. At the age of 14, that is exactly what Alan decided to do after a younger cousin excitedly told him about the seance he'd just witnessed and that it's real and he knows how to do it. At first, Alan approached the idea more to humor his cousin with a little or no expectation that anything would happen. They didn't even need a Ouija board. Scramble letters could be laid out on a table to simulate one. A glass is placed upside down, index fingers lightly touching it, and the journey into what I call the spirit sphere begins. This particular journey was fairly uneventful, and at some stage the name Hannah was spelt out, but Alan suspected it was his cousin playing a trick on him and lost interest in it. It wasn't until the next day at school, having thought no more on the subject, when a new student was introduced to the class, a girl named Hannah. That's a bit freaky, he thought to himself. Maybe there is something to all this spiritual stuff. He intended to try it again as soon as possible to find out. He had taken the bait. In the meantime, his cousin had taught his mom how to do it and was steadily gaining experience and confidence in the comfort of his own lounge room rather than the stuffy little cavern with Alan the first time. Many more seances were conducted with new members being introduced as time went on. See how quickly things can spread and grow? Particularly amongst bored, impressionable teenagers looking for a cheap thrill. Mostly the Santas were treated like a game to impress and scare people at parties. Nothing particularly terrifying or malevolent ever came from it, at least as far as I know. But they did have conversations with the beyond and would ask questions like, what is your name? Are you male or female? Is there an afterlife? Is it better than here? Etc. Strangely, that last question was always answered with a resounding no, which is a little disconcerting. Were they essentially opening a portal to purgatory? Attracting these poor wretched souls like moths to a porch light? Otherwise wandering blind and aimless? in some eternal night? Are some of these entities ancient demonic beings eager to create harm and cause mischief upon the earth? Going on some of the names that were spelt during the seances, I would not be at all surprised. Names like Sikram, Puck, Malik, for example. On one occasion, the glass launched itself off the table and smashed violently against the wall. And I think it was that experience which convinced Alan to retire from seances just to be on the safe side. Up until telling me his story, it had been his belief that the spirit was trapped in the glass throughout the seance, and that it was a simple matter to blow into the glass, to release it back into the wild, so to speak, upon its conclusion. I must say I laughed when he told me this and related to him a photo I once saw of some people having a seance in the dimly lit room of some reputedly haunted old abandoned homestead. Overlaid upon one of the participants was a vaporous figure whose skeletal form could be clearly discerned. It was as if this skeletal ghost was superimposed upon the person, borrowing their body its bony arms lining up with their arms, its ghostly hands upon theirs, as if it's helping to move the pointer around on the Ouija board. I also told him how spirits don't always leave when you want them to, and other disturbing examples to illustrate that 
Many things people believe about the spirit world are simply nonsense and serve only to relay a sense of false security that they are in control when in fact it is often the entity that is in control of them. It was with a dawning realization and a steady wave of goosebumps that Alan finished telling me his story. He said it was years later, amongst some people at a party, that he started telling them about seances, and one of them said, hey, let's do one. That would be cool. Another cousin of his, Corey, who was quite drunk and known to be a bit of a tool, even when sober, declared loudly and obnoxiously how he thought it was all bullshit, but that he would go along anyway just for laughs. Not a good attitude to have right from the get-go, it soon turned out. Seems some of these beings can take particular exception to any loudmouth skeptics that may be present, especially drunken moronic skeptics like this fellow was. After setting up the Scrabble letters and finding an appropriate glass, about six people sat down in the darkened kitchen to begin. Six index fingers rested ever so lightly upon the upturned glass as Alan began asking the usual questions. All the while, Corey is rolling his eyes, giggling, slurping back his beer, and making jokes when suddenly the glass starts to vibrate and buck and rattle on the hard, smooth table as if charged with an intense, angry energy. The table, trailing white-nailed index fingers, just as suddenly begins to move, taking a direct and deliberate path straight towards a now silent and slack-jawed quarry. It was moving frighteningly fast, pushing the Scrabble letters aside as it did so, accelerating towards him as if intending harm. Arms were now stretching to maintain contact with the glass, when, as if on cue, everyone removed their fingers all at once and just sat there in stunned silence, looking at the now stationary glass sitting right in front of Corey. Alan swore after that, never to do it again. It was too intense and powerful to be rationalized or laughed away. He resolved not to ever visit the Ouija board from that day forward. Knowing what he knows now, he considers himself lucky he got away so lightly and is quick to warn others not to dabble in the dark lands where roam the dead and disembodied spirits of a realm we should all fear to tread. I am going to be sharing with you two experiences. The one that took me from being a complete skeptic to a believer and resulted in me becoming a spirit board medium for over eight years, as well as the one that made me walk away from them forever. I was based in Bosnia and Herzegovina in 1994 as part of the United Nations Protection Force, or UNPROFOR, during the war there. Soldiers, being soldiers, do almost anything to keep themselves amused and keep their minds off the things that they were seeing on a daily basis. And I came in one day from a patrol around Novi Travnik to find my ISO container accommodation unit full with fellow soldiers, along with a close friend who, for the benefit of this, I will call Bob, sat at a makeshift table with a spirit board. We were told that Bob was going to do a session, and, amused by it all, we eagerly sat down to watch what was going to unfold. Bob kicked off the session with three other soldiers around the board with him, and within a few minutes had made contact with something on the board. That something turned out to be Joanna, the girlfriend of Jim, that's not his real name, who had passed away in a car crash. She was hit by a drunk driver a few months prior to his deployment and was one of those sitting at the board. Now, Jim was obviously a little upset through the interaction, but the rest of us observing found it highly amusing. And again, soldiers being soldiers were shouting 
banter to the four men at the table and the fake presentation they were performing. They took this all with a pinch of salt initially, but as time went on, they were quite visibly getting annoyed with our outbursts. It finally came to a head with Bob losing his cool amongst jeers of I saw him push the glass, mainly from me. He instructed Jim to leave the board after accusing him and go into the next unit. Write something on a bit of paper and place it in an envelope, seal it, and then come back. Jim shot off and returned a few minutes later with an envelope in hand and was instructed by Bob to place it on one of the corners of the board. Bob continued for a few minutes more to the backdrop of more jeering and banter for my direction before turning to me and inviting me onto the board. Wanting to prove the whole thing as a setup, I jumped at the chance and sat next to Bob. He then pulled another three men from the jeering crowd and invited them to join in place of the guys already on the board. After the swap, Bob gave me a few basic do's and don'ts before leaving the board himself. There were now four complete skeptics sitting around the board with fingers on the glass. Under prompts from Bob, now sitting on a bunk across from us, I started asking questions to Joanna. The first time the glass moved, honestly, I felt like I messed myself, along with the other three guys on it. The crowd, seeing our reactions, realized that everything was not as it seemed, and a silence fell upon the unit for the first time that night. After a further period of communication, I was confused, unnerved, and unsure of what was going on. Most of all, though, I was intrigued. But Bob was about to pull the final act that would make me question what I thought about the paranormal forever. Under suggestion from Bob, we asked if Joanna could see what was on the paper sealed within the envelope and on the corner of the board to which she replied, yes. We asked her to spell out what the message was, to which she responded, friends forever. And no, I did not make a spelling mistake. You see, Jim was slightly dyslexic, and when he opened the envelope, that was exactly how he had written it on the paper, with the missing eye from friends. I will never, ever forget that. You could have heard a pin drop in the room. Eleven skeptics and four believers walked into that unit that night. Fifteen believers walked out. Anyway, long story short, I found out after that Bob was Wicca and did spirit boards on a regular basis. So, of course, I spent as much of my free time with him until I left the army in 1998 and learned what I could about spirit boards from him. I then spent further time with people he had introduced me to in civvy streets during periods of leave and learned more. I went on to conduct regular spirit board sessions by myself for eight years thereafter. As I stated earlier, my views and beliefs did a complete U-turn following this event. I have experienced and witnessed too many unexplainable things during my eight-year period as a spirit board medium, many of which throw the theory of the ideomotor effect out into the trash. I myself repeated Bob's little example on occasions to show people that the sessions were no hoax, with the occasional visit still from Joanna, who was only too happy to communicate with me further. The Second Experience In October of 2007, I was invited to conduct a session for a group of people as part of their Halloween festivities in the Spalding area, Lincolnshire. Having conducted a number of sessions for them in the past, I agreed to attend and conduct a session, by their request, at 0300 as considered to be the witching hour. I produced a Hellgate board. Please don't ask, I will not tell you. An oak for the event, again. Something I had done before and used to get some really good responses with. 
The event started off normally with the lighting of the candles, sealing of the glass, and a protection ritual. There was six of us, myself included, around the board and eight spectators, including the scriber, who was responsible for recording all of the board activity for review at a later time. We had a resident presence, our Fred, come through and spend a bit of time with us, much to the enjoyment of the group, before we said goodbye to him and let him move on. Things then went quiet for a bit before we started to get another response. From the outstart, something just did not sit right with this presence. I can't explain it. There was just this feeling deep inside of me. We had a lot of glass movement, but at the same time, it was very sporadic. It would give us no information and refuse to follow simple instructions, such as returning to the center of the board. Now, initially, there was nothing abnormal here. Jokers and clowns do this all the time before they settle down. However, the force on the glass was slowly getting more forceful the longer we tried to make actual communication with the entity. As we progressed, the entity seemed to be getting more confident with itself, and the glass movement started to become even stronger, and it was spending more time trying to head to my line of limitation, located in the front of the Hellgate with the group having to physically stop the glass on more than one occasion. All of this time, though, not a single thing had been said through the board, and at this point, we still had no idea who or what we were dealing with. After a few minutes of this, the glass finally started spelling out things. But at that moment in time, it just appeared to be gibberish to us. It was my scriber that actually realized what we were getting messages through. The reason we could not understand what was being said was because everything was being given to us in reverse. Now, this is where I should have stopped the session there and then, potentially facing a negative energy and closed the board. Instead, I let entry get the better of me and allow the session to continue something I regretted for many years after that event. We continued to get responses, both in reverse and now normal phrases, mostly threatening those on the board. And then we started receiving responses in what we found out after the event through research, Latin. In my whole spirit board career, I have never received anything in Latin during any previous events. I had heard about it happening through my teachings, and apparently it was not a good sign, but never experienced it. The one phrase we got upon review that I will never forget was, Angelus Reprobi, which we translated to, Fallen Angel. During all of this time, we never received a name for the entity, and the glass got that strong in its movements at one point. The six of us on the board were struggling to keep up with it. The session came to a finale, with people now starting to panic a little, with the glass making a direct line for Hellgate on the board. We quickly applied all the pressure we could to stop the glass, and I found myself shouting at the entity to return to the center of the board. The glass started moving a lot slower than it had all evening. I remember thinking that maybe it had used most of its energy during this dash on the board and fighting us trying to stop it, and positioned itself at the center. Then the glass imploded. Now, understand this. This thing did not just shatter outwards or crack and come apart. This thing went in on itself. This, honestly, was the second time in my life that I actually felt true fear. After being taken back for a few moments and after gathering my thoughts, I conducted an impromptu cleansing ritual, and we quickly and appropriately disposed of the board. Myself and a couple of others experienced an attachment with very disturbing nightmares following the event over the next few nights. And even more eerily, 
they all were the very same in nature. A very tall, dark figure taunting us from within shadows, faceless people being horrifically tortured, and the death of loved ones, all very graphic in nature. My marriage with my very loving wife also broke down very quickly after, as well as run of my other bad luck that seemed to keep following me for a period of time. I vowed following this event that I would never have anything to do with spirit boards again, and have not touched one since despite numerous requests over the years from people I have previously met through holding sessions for them. I still have contact with some of the people and who were still close friends that were there during the morning and witnessed the events that unfolded. We recollect the night in conversation occasionally and laugh about it now, but there still exists an uncomfortable feeling of just how lucky we were to get off as lightly as we did. Believe in what you want. Take the piss and belittle me if you are that immature. Lots of Bored users have had similar, or worse, things happen to them. There are things in this world we just cannot comprehend or explain. Using spirit or Ouija boards can open doorways to things that are really not very nice at all. I believe we encountered a very negative entity that morning, even though I had done everything right and according to my teachings. This is why people who have used Ouija boards and had negative occurrences tell others to take heed and stay away from them. They are not paranoid, overreacting, or talking bullshit. They have seen and experienced it for themselves, and they do not want to see others harmed, potentially go through a diabolical haunting or some other misadventure. It was in the late 70s, and my best friend and I decided to try a Ouija board that happened to be amongst the things that her mother's father had left behind when he passed away. This man was not a very nice man in life. My friend, I'll just call her Joan, told me all about the things her mother told her about him. He had basically made his children's and his wife's lives hell on earth and Joan's mother married in order to escape it. When Joan told me about the Ouija board, my interest was instantly piqued. You want to try it? She asked over the phone. Yes, I'll be right over, I replied. At that time, I didn't have a driver's license. We lived in a tiny town of around 700, and setting out on foot to her house was no big deal, even though it was across town. I was so eager to get started on the Ouija board. I made it there in record time. Once I was at her house and she ushered me in, she carefully pulled the box that held the Ouija board from the closet in the mudroom. I followed her into her other room where we would begin our session with this relic that to us was steeped in delicious mystery and even better yet, completely forbidden. Not only were we flaunting our rebellion by disobeying our parents, but we were stepping over a threshold into a dark supernatural abyss. Joan took the board out of the box and placed it on a low platform on the floor, and I took my place on one side and she on the other. We each took a breath in unison as our eyes met across the minuscule distance. Neither of us had even the smallest flicker of hesitation or doubt. Let's do this, we announced to each other in a sort of telepathic silence. What do we ask, I said. We hadn't even considered that. A brief moment of silence as we pondered, and then Joan indicated that we placed our hands on the planchette and we did so with a natural reverence for things unknown. Joan cleared her throat. Where are you from? She called out. At first there was nothing, 
We frowned at each other. She repeated her question. This time, the planchette moved, seeming to glide across the board on its own accord. We glanced at each other with knitting brow, suddenly questioning the honesty of the other. Are you doing that? Joan asked. No, I came back irritated. The evening was slipping across the room in deep shadow. The sound of the planchette as it made its way to a single letter was almost silken. Then it stopped. We made note of the letter as it quickly made its way to another. Here it finally spilt out. I felt a chill. Joan was not convinced. She was sure I was the driving force powering the planchette. I felt indignant. Ask it something else, Joan almost demanded. I bit my lip and studied the board. In all of my 15 years on Earth, this was becoming as close to a scary movie as I could get. I had to make it good. Are you attached to me or Joan? I asked, grinning. Joan gasped, eyes wide. We grew quiet, leaning over the board, placing our hands ever so slightly again on the planchette, and it spelled out my name. This time, I became the incredulous one. Stop it, I growled at her. It's not me, she protested. We had lit a candle in only the soft amber light of a small lamp on her bedside table accompanied its tiny flame. The evening had deepened. We stared at each other across the Ouija board. I made note of her facial features in shadow now, adding to what I began to feel was the unfolding of our own personal horror movie. Innocently enough, we pressed on. How long have you been with her? Joan asked. I felt my heart thump against my ribs. I wasn't sure I wanted to know, but I also wasn't sure that Joan was pulling my leg. I know absolutely that I wasn't the one guiding the planchette. It had to be her. This time the planchette spelled out, since you were eight, as if it were talking to me. This isn't funny, I stated and Joan insisted she wasn't the one spelling everything. She was as deeply convinced that it was me. Ask it something else, she practically demanded. I knew what I wanted to know, so I said it out loud. What do you want from me? The planchette paused. We had our hands lightly on it, waiting. It made a couple of false starts, but then began its confident trek across the board to spell out the answer. When its answer became evident, we were both horrified. I want to F you, was its reply. I got angry and released the planchette and set quickly back from the Ouija board and glared at Joan. But the look on her face was equally angry and disgusted. Oh, stop it, she shouted again at me. That's not even funny. I didn't do it, I defended. And then, just like that, the candle blew out. It was as though someone put their lips close to the flame and blew, complete with the sound of the softly forced air passing between them. We gasped in unison. The room was dark, but not completely. Now the amber glow of the lamp was alone in providing illumination to the room. Joan and I stared at each other, wide-eyed in disbelief. We knew this was an impossible feat, yet there it was, remaining staunchly inexplicable and frightening. I felt the hair along the back of my neck stand up straight. My heart was pounding. I wanted to leap into Joan's arms for comfort but neither of us wanted to move. And now, just as we began to come back to our senses, the candle, just like that, relit. It relit. All by itself. On its own accord. 
with no one near it to do so. We both backed away from the Ouija board and the candle, and then leapt into each other's arms and hugged each other very closely. Eyes riveted on that glowing candle, its flame calmly dancing gently within the unseen air movements in her room. This was no trick candle. It was just an ordinary pillar candle that she had taken from the dining room to use for this very moment. To this day, I don't know how that could have ever happened. We decided to put the Ouija board away for good, but strange things began to happen in her home that didn't stop until she took the board out of the house and into the garbage can in the back of her house. Back then, we could still burn our trash in the metal garbage cans, and that's exactly what they did with the Ouija board in theirs. Only then did the paranormal things cease for her. I've never felt like there was anything to what it had told us about being with me since I was eight. So, I have no idea what that meant. However, I've always been sensitive to the emotions of others. I've been told I'm an empath, have always had prophetic dreams, and have seen unexplainable things that I really don't want to get into right now. Regardless of that, I can't explain what was meant by that message, nor can I explain that candle. And that, my dear listeners, brings a close to these true Ouija board stories. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Patty's niece, Chrissy Elias, Anita V, Donna, Luz Crispin, Samantha Place, Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, Stephanie McLaren, Denise S, Tina Mead, Tammy Slayton, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Amy Klimko, and Haunted. Again, you all know how much I am grateful. You know how much I love each and every one of you. Thank you for remaining the pillars upon which this channel stands. I can't thank you enough. To the subscribers, to the first time listeners, and for the peekaboos, as I'm now going to refer, the ones that just peek in to see what the channel's about. Thank you so much for your support. Without you, I wouldn't have a voice and there would not be a back to ashes. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed these stories. Until next time, please take care of yourselves. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.